The plastics chemical BPA was banned from baby bottles in Canada in 2008, in France in 2010, in all of Europe in 2011, and in the United States in 2012. But in 2015, France forbid the use of BPA in any food or beverage packaging, something the U.S. FDA decided was not warranted. Uh, but what about the 90-plus studies reporting links between BPA levels in people's urine with a wide array of adverse health outcomes, including an apparent significant increase in the likelihood of developing heart disease and diabetes, obesity, impaired liver, immune and kidney function, inflammation, reproductive effects in women and men, and altered thyroid function, and developmental deficits in children, such as aggressiveness, hyperactivity, and impaired learning. Only a very small minority of studies appear to support the federal government's assertions that there were no effects at low doses. So where's the disconnect? Governments determine safety levels by sticking tubes down into the stomachs of lab animals. The BPA is released directly into the stomach, where it goes to the liver to be detoxified into an inactive form called BPA glucuronide. So very little active BPA gets into the bloodstream. But that's not what studies on humans show. People have active BPA in their blood, and so the FDA response was to reject all such human studies as implausible. The problem with a blanket rejection of human data is that there may be sources of BPA exposure that are not modeled by stomach tube exposure in rats. After all, this isn't how food enters our bodies, actually. I mean, we chew it, or we move it around our mouths before it enters the stomach. And it turns out BPA can be completely absorbed directly into the bloodstream from the mouth, thus bypassing instant liver detoxification. The same would be the case for BPA absorbed through the skin. So-called thermal paper is 1-2% BPA by weight. Uh, that's like cash register receipts, uh, luggage tags, bus, train, lottery tickets. Uh, taking hold of a receipt can transfer BPA to our fingers, especially if they're wet or greasy, but does it then get absorbed into our system through the skin? Well, uh, cashiers were found to have more BPA flowing through their bodies, but that was just based on a few people. Same problem with uh, studies showing those eating plant-based diets having lower levels, uh, too small of a sample size really to make a, a, a conclusion. It's been estimated that even cashiers handling receipts all day long may not exceed the tolerable intake. However, if they're using something like hand cream, that could change. Many skin care products, hand sanitizers, lotions, soaps, and sunscreens contain chemicals that enhance skin penetration. So using a hand sanitizer before touching receipt could, in theory, cause a breakdown of the skin barrier. Uh, theoretically, that is, until now. We now know that holding a receipt and eating food after using hand sanitizer results in high blood levels of active BPA. Researchers at the University of Missouri conducted a study to mimic aspects of the behavior of people in a fast food restaurant, where they've observed people using a hand sanitizer, handling a receipt, and then eating food with their hands. They found that when people handled a receipt right after using Purell, BPA was transferred to their fingers, then fries, and then the combination of absorption through the skin and the mouth led to significant levels of active BPA in their blood. You can hold a receipt in your hand for 60 seconds and only come away with 3 micrograms in your body, whereas if you pre-wet your hands with hand sanitizer, you can get 300 in just a few seconds, 100 times more. These findings show that just a few seconds touching a receipt after using something like hand lotion could transfer large amounts of BPA, and so this could explain why dozens of human studies show active BPA in people's systems, contrary to the assumptions based on stomach tube studies in rodents. When actual evidence contradicts your assumptions, you reject the assumptions, but what the FDA did was instead reject the evidence. This is not a slice of pizza, but could perhaps be thought of as the result of two many slices of pizza. This is what the inside of our major arteries look like 
in an advanced stage of atherosclerosis, lined with fat and cholesterol. Uh, we know that coronary artery disease doesn't just magically appear, though. The disease begins during early childhood, progressing unrecognized for several decades to its often final and unexpected endpoint of chest pain, disability, or simply death. We need to remind ourselves that atherosclerosis begins in childhood, as fatty streaks in the arteries, which are the precursors of the advanced lesions that ultimately kill us. By our 20s, 20% of the inner surface of the artery coming off the heart is covered in fatty streaks. So 50 years ago, pathologists started raising the question of whether heart disease is best handled by cardiologists or by pediatricians. Because by their 30s, many young adults already have advanced coronary atherosclerosis. An intervention from our 30s on is actually what's called secondary prevention, just trying to mediate the ravages of the disease rather than prevent the disease itself, because advanced atherosclerosis is likely already present. And we're exporting the problem around the world. Young, thin, apparently healthy individuals, yet 97% of their collected arteries looked like this. So even in developing countries where they've acquired our eating habits, we're seeing an epidemic of heart disease and sudden death, that is, if you're not shot first. Moreover, the risk factors that correlate with the extent of such early lesions are the same risk factors that correlate with heart attacks later in life. In other words, it's the same disease, just in the early stages. So pathologists, the ones doing the autopsies on all these young people and seeing all the, this coronary artery disease, began urging many years ago that preventive measures should be instituted earlier in life. We've known that fatty streaks exist in young children for over a century. But it wasn't until 1994 that a task force convened by the government came up with a radical idea. The strategic key and the greatest opportunity in preventing cardiovascular disease is to prevent the development of risk in the first place. In my video, Heart Disease Starts in Childhood, I noted that fatty streaks, the first stage of atherosclerosis, were found in the arteries of nearly 100% of kids by AIDS age 10, raised on the standard American diet. In recognition of this fact, the latest Academy of Pediatrics recommendation is that all kids get their cholesterol tested starting between the ages of 9 and 11. Of course, this has drug companies salivating at the thought of slipping statins into Happy Meals, but long-term drug intervention is costly and may be associated with adverse effects. They're talking about lifestyle modification. In my video, How Many Meet the Simple 7, I revealed the breathtaking statistic that only about 1 in 2,000 U.S. adults met the seven American Heart Association criteria for a heart-healthy lifestyle. What about American teenagers? Of the 4,673 adolescents aged 12 through 19 that were studied, zero made the cut. What was the main sticking point? Well, you know, most teen boys and girls don't smoke. The, the white bars show the percentage meeting the criteria. Most aren't overweight, but almost no one ate a healthy diet. Less than 1% of young men and women met a minimum of healthy diet criteria. This sorry state of affairs is what's behind this controversial paper suggesting that the current generation of U.S. children and adolescents, our children, may be one of the first generations to be less healthy and have a shorter lifespan than their parents. It is well accepted that coronary atherosclerosis is a chronic progressive disease that begins early in life and slowly progresses over several decades before symptoms arise. However, the average age in cholesterol-lowering drug trials is 63, and therefore you know, people had already been exposed to a lifetime of circulating LDL cholesterol. Uh, so no wonder pharmaceutical therapies typically reduce cardiovascular disease risk by only 20 to 30 percent. We know LDL, so-called bad cholesterol, plays a central role in the initiation, development, and progression of our number one killer. Over a hundred prospective studies involving more than a million people have demonstrated that those with higher LDL levels 
are at higher risk. It seems reasonable to assume that if lowering cholesterol later in life can help, then keeping LDL levels low early in life may prevent our arteries from getting clogged in the first place. But let's not just assume. It would be considered unethical to set up a controlled clinical trial in which young adults with elevated serum cholesterol levels were treated or not treated over their lifetime, uh, just like you couldn't ethically set up a study in which half the kids are made to start smoking to see if smoking really does cause lung cancer. That's where observational studies come in. You can follow people who already smoke and compare their disease rates to those that don't. It's like 40 years ago when the president of the American Heart Association tried to argue that we should all stop smoking even though there were no randomized controlled trials. Look, uh, those who smoke have a higher risk of heart attack. The more we smoke, the higher the risk, and after we stop, our risk drops. The same can be said for high cholesterol. If you look at young men aged 18 through 39 and follow them for up to 34 years, Cholesterol levels, even when you're young, predicts long-term risk of heart disease and death. Men in their 20s and 30s who have a total cholesterol even just under 200 have a substantially longer estimated life expectancy, around four to nine years longer than those over 240. Evidence from observational studies, however, is vulnerable to so-called confounding factors. Eating a diet plant-based enough to lower cholesterol below average may add years to our lives regardless of what our cholesterol is. Ideally, we'd have a long-term randomized controlled trial, and nature may have actually set one up for us. Each of us, at conception, gets a random assortment of genes from our mother and our father, and some of those genes may affect our cholesterol levels. Uh, just like there's rare genetic mutations that result in unusually high cholesterol, there are rare genetic mutations that lead to unusually low cholesterol. Providing an ideal system to assess the consequences of low LDL cholesterol levels independent of confounding diet and lifestyle factors. Uh, let me show you what I mean. About 1 in 40 African Americans have a mutation that drops their LDL cholesterol from up around 130 down towards more optimal levels. Now, this group didn't eat healthy to get there, it's just in their genes. More than half had high blood pressure, there were lots of smokers and diabetics, yet those with genetically low LDL levels still had a significant reduction in the incidence of coronary heart disease, even in the presence of all these other risk factors. How significant? How much less heart disease? How about 88% of heart disease gone? The astounding finding was that the heart disease risk in these individuals was reduced by more than 80%, whereas the same 20 to 40 de uh, per point decrease in LDL from drugs only reduces risk like 30%. Makes sense, though, right? The folks with the mutation had low levels like that their whole life. They didn't just start taking some pill when they were 60 years old. The magnitude of the effect of long-term exposure to lower LDL cholesterol concentrations observed in each of these studies represents threefold greater reduction in the risk of heart disease compared to drug treatment started later in life. For you uh, fellow research nerds out there, check out that p-value. You'd have to do like a quintillion studies to get that kind of result by chance. Therefore, a primary prevention strategy that promotes keeping LDL cholesterol levels as low as possible, beginning as early in life as possible, and sustaining those low levels of LDL throughout the whole of one's lifetime has the potential to dramatically reduce the risk of coronary heart disease, and that's just what a healthy diet can do. The regulation of dietary supplements in the United States has been described as too little, too late. Dietary supplements may be adulterated with dangerous compounds, be contaminated, uh, fail to contain what they say they contain, or contain unknown doses of the ingredients listed on the label, be sold at toxic dosages, or produce harmful effects in other ways. Uh, this not only messes up any research done on them, but can put the general public at risk. A third-party company that has tested thousands of supplements identified approximately one in four with a quality problem, either not containing what it says or contaminated in some way. One in four. For example, I've done a few videos on the remarkable properties of black raspberries. can't always find them fresh or frozen, so how about black raspberry supplements? 
You go to the store, or look online. How about this one? Fresh, raw, pure. That sounds good. Let's look at the back. It says it contains just seedless black raspberry powder and absolutely nothing else! Exclamation point. It's nice to see that there's no fillers or artificial ingredients, so you plunk down your $23.77, but it turns out you've been had. The first clue was that the picture on the front was actually blackberries, photoshopped to look like black raspberries. They couldn't even be bothered to put a real image on their fake supplement. The researcher's second clue was that it sure didn't look like pure black raspberry powder, and so they put it to the test. And indeed, there was no black raspberry at all. Instead of absolutely nothing else, they should have just stopped with this bottle contains absolutely nothing, or at least you hope it contains nothing. Who knows what's actually in those capsules? They tested every black raspberry product they could find, and even ones with the right picture on the front and powder that actually looked real, yet more than a third appeared to have no black raspberry fruit at all. At the moment, a consumer who assumes the U.S. dietary supplement marketplace is free from risk, or even honest, is unfortunately naive. How widespread is this deception? Researchers use DNA fingerprinting techniques to test the authenticity of 44 herbal supplements from a dozen different companies. Less than half of the supplements were authentic, containing what they said they did. Most contains pl contained plants not listed on the label, uh, substitutions with cheaper plants, contaminants, unlisted fillers, or apparently all filler. And this isn't just fraud. Uh, some of this deception can really hurt people. For example, one St. John's wort supplement had no St. John's wort at all, but actually contained senna instead, which is an herbal laxative that can cause adverse effects such as chronic diarrhea, liver damage, skin breakdown, and blistering. Here's how the 12 companies did. Only tested products from two of the 12 companies all appeared authentic. Herbs only work if they're actually present. The supplement industry suffers from unethical activities by some of the manufacturers, and by some they mean 80% of the manufacturers in this study. Until dietary supplements in the U.S. are better regulated and quality control standards are defined and endorsed, the safer source of phytonutrients as a consumer is from actual food. High-protein diets during pregnancy helpful or harmful? A question answered about 40 years ago in the infamous Harlem trial of 1976, a randomized controlled trial of nutritional supplementation in pregnancy in a poor black urban population. The study was begun at a time when protein was just assumed to be deficient in the diets of the poor. Had they actually analyzed their diets before they started, they would have realized that wasn't true. But why let facts get in the way of assumptions? So they split poor black pregnant women into three groups and gave them an extra 40 grams of animal protein a day, and basically a couple cans of Ensure, versus about six extra grams of animal protein, or no extra protein, and sat back and watched what happened. The high-protein group suffered an excess of very early premature births and associated infant deaths, as well as significant growth retardation in the babies that survived. More protein meant more prematurity, more deaths, and more growth retardation. And when kids grow up, animal protein intake during pregnancy has been associated with children becoming overweight later in life and getting high blood pressure. The offspring of mothers who reported eating more meat and fish had higher blood pressure in adulthood. This was part of another failed dietary intervention trial in which mothers were advised to eat a pound of meat a day. The increased weight gain and high blood pressure may be due to the obesity causing chemical pollutants in the meat supply, as I've talked about before, or the animal protein induced, in the, uh, induced rise in the growth hormone IGF-1, or it could be due to a steroid stress hormone called cortisol. A single meal high in animal protein can nearly double the level of stress hormone in the blood uh, within a half hour of consumption, 
much more than a meal closer to the recommended level of protein. Uh, give someone a meal of crab meat, tuna fish, cottage cheese, and the stress hormone levels shoot up. But instead, give someone some barley soup and a vegetable stir-fry and rice, and the stress hormone level goes down after the meal. Right? And imagine if you did the you know, meat, fish, dairy, meal after meal, day after day. You could chronically stimulate your stress response axis and increase the release of vasoactive hormones that can increase your blood pressure. And all that extra cortisol release has been linked to increased risk for elevated blood levels of insulin, triglycerides, and cholesterol. If you take men on a high-protein diet, meat, fish, poultry, egg whites, and switch them to a high-carb diet of bread, vegetables, fruit, and sugary junk, their cortisol levels drop about a quarter within 10 days. At the same time, their testosterone levels shoot up by about the same amount. High-protein diets suppress testosterone. That's why if you take men eating plant-based diets and have them start eating meat every day, their testosterone levels go down, and actually some estrogens go up. That's why bodybuilders can get such low testosterone levels. It's not the steroids they're taking. If you look at natural bodybuilders who don't use steroids, 75% drop in testosterone levels in the months leading up to a competition. Right? Testosterone levels cut by more than half, uh, enough to drop a guy into an abnormally low range. It's ironic that they're eating protein to look manly on the outside, but it makes them less and less manly on the inside. And from an obesity standpoint in general, a drop in testosterone levels may increase the risk of gaining weight, gaining body fat. Uh, what does cortisol have to do with weight? Well, there's actually a disease caused by having too much cortisol called Cushing syndrome. And this is kind of a before and after in terms of abdominal obesity, which is most of that white. Even in normal women, though, chronic stress, chronic high cortisol levels can contribute to obesity. And if they're pregnant, uh, high meat, low carb diets may increase cortisol levels in the mom, which can lead to inappropriate fetal exposure to cortisol, which in turn can affect the developing fetus, resetting their whole stress response thermostat, leading to higher cortisol levels their whole life, which can have serious health consequences. It can stick with them their whole lives. And indeed, that's what they found. Every maternal daily portion of meat and fish was associated with 5% higher cortisol levels in their children as much as 30 years later, though green vegetable consumption was found to be protective. Higher meat and fish consumption, like uh, three servings a day compared to one or two, was associated with significantly higher cortisol levels, but eating greens every day appeared to blunt some of that excess stress response. And the adult children of mothers who ate a lot of meat during pregnancy don't just walk around with higher stress hormone levels, but also appear to react more negatively to whatever life throws at them. If you put them through that trier test, which involves public speaking in front of a panel of judges, followed by a live math exercise, Here's the stress hormone responses in those moms who ate uh, less than two servings of meat a day versus about two a day versus about two to three servings a day. Uh, note before the test started, the two lower mother meat groups started out about the same, just walking around, but their exaggerated cortisol responses was laid bare when exposed to a stressful situation. Now the real-world effects of this is that after that sort of test, if you give people their own private snack buffet with fruits and veggies versus fatty, sugary comfort foods like chocolate cake, guess who eats less fruits and veggies? Those who have these high chronic stress levels. Cortisol has been implicated as a factor in motivating food intake even when you're not really hungry. So no surprise that animal protein intake during pregnancy may lead to larger weight gain for her children later in life, and maybe even her grandchildren. That's how much the stress axis can get mucked around. Recent evidence suggests that the long-term adverse consequences may not be limited to one generation. The diet of a pregnant mother may affect the development and disease risk of her children and even her grandchildren. Ultimately, these findings may shed light on a rapidly expanding epidemics of diabetes, obesity, and heart disease.
Although recent increases in the availability of junk food and decreases in the availability of physical activity have created an obesity-permissive environment, several other factors may contribute. Uh, we know, for example, the use of antibiotics is linked to obesity, so our gut flora may play a role. Recently, specific bacterial species were identified. There are, uh, are these eight species of bacteria that seem protective against weight gain, and they all are producers of a short-chain fatty acid called butyrate. Uh, see, early on we just thought that there may be some intestinal bacteria that were able to extract additional calories from what we ate, but the relationship between our gut flora and obesity has proven to be more complex. Our gut flora may affect how we metabolize fat, for example, through the hormone FIAF, fasting-induced adipose factor. Uh, so when we're fasting, our body has to stop storing fat, instead start burning it off. And fasting-induced adipose factor is one of the hormones that uh, signals your body to do this, which can be useful for someone who's obese, and maybe one way our gut flora manages our weight. Uh, see, some bacteria repress this hormone, thereby increasing fat storage, whereas our fiber-eating bacteria those that secrete short-chain fatty acids like butyrate when we feed them with fiber, are able to upregulate this hormone in all human cell lines so far tested. Currently, when an individual fails to lose weight, the only other option is surgery. But as the mechanisms of our gut flora's role in weight regulation are elucidated, one can envision transplanting the intestinal contents from a thin person into an obese person. Such so-called fecal transplants may suffer from Repulsive aesthetics, though, turns out there may be easier ways to share. We've known that people who live together share a greater similarity in gut bacteria than those who live apart. Now this could be because they inadvertently swap bacteria back and forth, or maybe it's just because they eat similar diets, you know, living in the same house. We didn't know until now. Not only do cohabitating family members share bacteria with one another, they also share with their dogs, who are probably eating a different diet than they are. In fact, homes may harbor a distinct microbial fingerprint that can be predicted by their occupants. Just by swabbing the doorknobs, you can tell which family lives in which house. Isn't that wild? And when a family moves into a new home, the microbial community in the new house rapidly shifts towards that of the old house, suggesting rapid colonization by the family's bacteria. Experimental evidence suggests that individuals raised in a household of skinny people may be protected against obesity, no fecal transplant necessary. People may be sharing gut bacteria from kitchen stools instead. And check this out. People living together share more bacteria than those living apart. We already knew that. But add a dog to the mix, and the people's bacteria get even closer. Dogs can act like a bridge to pass bacteria back and forth between people. Curiously, owning cats does not seem to have the same effect, maybe because they're not drinking out of the toilet bowl as much? Exposure to pet bacteria may actually be beneficial. It's intriguing to consider that who we cohabitate with, including companion animals, may alter our physiology by influencing the bacteria that we harbor in and on our various body habitats. Maybe that's why recent studies link early exposure to pets to decreased prevalence of allergies, respiratory conditions, and other immune disorders as kids grow older. I've talked about those studies in which dog exposure early in life may decrease respiratory infections, especially ear infections. Children with dogs were significantly healthier. But we didn't know why. We didn't know the mechanism until perhaps now. The first study tying together the protection from respiratory disease through pet exposure to differences in gut bacteria. Uh, none of the study infants in homes with pets had suffered from wheezy bronchitis within the first two years of life, whereas 15% of the pet-deprived infants had. In comparing stool samples, this correlated with differences in gut bacteria, depending on the presence of pets in the home. There was this famous study, 12 thousand people that found that a person's chances of becoming obese increased by 57% if he or she had a friend who became obese, suggesting social ties have a big effect. But given the evidence implicating the role of gut bacteria in obesity, this raises up the possibility that cravings and associated obesity might not just be socially contagious, like you all go out to eat the same fattening food together, but rather truly contagious 
like catching a cold. Stroke remains one of the most devastating of all neurological diseases, killing about 5 million people a year worldwide, and is the leading cause of permanent disability in the United States. But the good news is that about 80% of stroke risk may be due to basic lifestyle factors, primarily improving your diet, stopping smoking, and getting regular exercise. The best way to stop smoking, evidently, is to have a heart attack. If you die, you automatically stop smoking, unless you're incinerated, I guess. And if you live, repeated strong advice from your doctor may persuade up to two-thirds to quit. Never smoke again, in any form, as long as you live. Yes, it's very addictive. Yes, it's very difficult. It doesn't matter. It has to be done. If you're walking along the lakeshore and one of your grandchildren is drowning, it's not a matter of willpower, it just has to be done. It's like a healthy diet. Some things just have to be done. Getting up at night to feed a baby can be difficult too, but it's not a matter of willpower. Some things in life just have to be done. For stroke prevention, that means a more plant-based diet, like a traditional Mediterranean diet centered around whole grains, fruits, vegetables, lentils, beans, and nuts. A vegetarian or vegan diet may also work, but must be accompanied by a regular, reliable source of vitamin B12, meaning B12 fortified foods or supplements. Unfortunately, recommending taking B12 supplements may meet opposition among vegetarians because misconceptions regarding this nutrient are prevalent. Many individuals still hold on to the old myth that deficiency of this vitamin is rare and only occurs in a small proportion of vegans. Future studies with vegetarians should focus on identifying ways of convincing vegetarians to routinely take vitamin B12 supplements in order to prevent a deficiency. The research is clear on that. Now we just need research on how we can convince vegetarians to actually take their B12 to prevent a deficiency. What is it about plant-based diets? Well, previously I talked about the role of fiber, potentially about a 1% drop in risk for every 1 gram of fiber per day, or maybe even a tad more, a 12% drop associated with every extra 10 grams a day. In fact, fiber from like whole grains associated with not only lower chance of dying from heart attack and stroke, uh, but also cancer and diabetes, and respiratory diseases and lower risk of dying even from infections or other causes. In other words, lower risk of dying prematurely from all causes put together. Why? Perhaps because of the anti-inflammatory effects of fiber, which could explain how it could help across the board. Or maybe they're eating fewer pro-inflammatory foods. Those who eat more whole plant foods, where fiber is found, may be eating less processed and animal foods. In fact, the study immediately preceding this one, this meta-analysis of fiber, was a meta-analysis on meat. Uh, they looked at red meat and processed meat, found about a 10% increased risk of stroke associated with each 3.5-ounce uh, daily portion. So that's like about the size of a deck of playing cards, or about 10% increased risk for every half deck of processed meat. Uh, perhaps it's because of the heme iron, the blood muscle iron in meat, uh, perhaps because of its pro-oxidative properties, uh, whereas no association was found between non-heme iron and stroke, the type of iron that predominates in plants. Or perhaps it's because of some of the toxic pollutants like PCBs that can build up in animal fat. Uh, we've known that like living next to a toxic waste dump might increase stroke risk, uh, but only recently have we realized that dietary exposure, even at so-called safe levels, may increase stroke risk. As much as eight or nine times the odds of stroke for those with the highest levels of these pollutants in their bloodstream. Back in the early 80s, a pathologist in Florida suggested that the reason premenopausal women are protected from heart disease is that they have lower stores of iron in their body. The thought was since oxidized cholesterol is important in atherosclerosis and oxidation is catalyzed by iron, maybe the lower iron stores of menstruating women reduce their risk of coronary heart disease. This novel suggestion that the longevity enjoyed by women over men might relate to the monthly blood loss was remarkable, but is it true? Well, the consumption of heme iron, the iron found in blood and muscle, is associated with increased risk of heart disease. Each milligram a day was associated with a 27% increase in risk. 
But heme iron is found mainly in meat, so it's possible some of the other constituents in meat, such as saturated fat and cholesterol, are responsible for the apparent link between heme iron and heart disease. If only we could find a way to get men to menstruate, then we could finally put the theory to the test. Well, what about blood donations? Why just lose a little every month when you can donate a whole unit at a time? This study in Nebraska suggested that blood donors seem to be, have reduced risk, but another study in Boston failed to show any connection. To resolve this question once and for all, one would really have to put it to the test. Take people at high risk for heart disease, randomly bleed half of them, and then follow them all over time and see who gets more heart attacks. Maybe it could turn the old bloodletting of the past into bleeding edge technology. And that was actually what was suggested in the original paper as a way to test this whole idea. It took 20 years, but researchers finally did it. Why did it take so long? Well, there isn't much money in bloodletting these days. The leech lobby just isn't as powerful as it used to be. What did they find? It didn't work. The blood donors ended up having the same number of heart attacks as the non-donor group. But something extraordinary happened. The cancer rates dropped a 37% reduction in overall cancer incidence, and those who developed cancer had a significantly reduced risk of death. An editorial in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute responded with near disbelief. The results almost seemed too good to be true. Uh, strikingly, they started to see cancer reduction benefits within six months, after, after just giving blood once. Here's cancer mortality as the study progressed. As you can see, the cancer death rates started to diverge within just six months. Uh, this is consistent with the spike in cancer rates we see within just six months of getting blood, getting a blood transfusion. Maybe that influx of iron accelerated the growth of hidden tumors. If cancer is indeed a so-called ferrotoxic disease, a consequence in part of iron toxicity, uh, that would explain not only the dramatic drop in cancer rates after blood donations, but also why people with higher levels of iron in their blood had an increased risk of dying from cancer, uh, why women who bleed into their ovaries are at high risk for ovarian cancer, and why those suffering an iron overload disease called hemochromatosis have up to 200 times the risk of cancer. There's even been a call to go back and look at some of the chemotherapy trials that kept taking blood from the chemo group to check for side effects. Uh, maybe just the iron removal from the blood draws accounted for some of the apparent chemo benefits. Iron may be a double-edged sword. Iron deficiency causes anemia, whereas excessive iron may increase cancer risk, presumably by acting as a pro-oxidant, generating free radicals. Iron deficiency anemia is a serious problem in the developing world, but in mediating countries, iron excess may be more of a problem than iron deficiency. Body iron stores accumulate insidiously with aging due to the fact that intake exceeds loss, and our body has no good way of getting rid of excess iron. Ferritin is a blood test measure of our backup iron stores. The normal range is 12 to 200, but just because it's normal doesn't mean it's ideal. In the blood donor study, those who developed cancer were up to here. The average for men may be over 100. This suggests that quote-unquote normal ambient levels of iron stores may be noxious and constitute a problem that affects large segments of the population. So there may be a need to redefine the normal range based on disease risk rather than just following a bell curve. Thus, iron deficiency may exist when ferritin levels decline to less than about 12, whereas ferrotoxic disease may start to occur with levels greater than about 50. Harvard recently looked at blood donations in colorectal cancer and found no connection. But the range of ferritin levels they were looking at were like from here to about here. Right? And those are the ones who reported giving blood like 30 or more times. So maybe instead of draining our blood to reduce excess iron stores, why not just 
prevent the iron overload in the first place. If you measure the iron stores of men that stay away from heme iron, that get all their iron from plants, their levels come in right around where the cancer-free donor group came in, which may help explain why those eating plant-based diets tend to have less cancer and other diseases associated with iron overload, such as prediabetes, as well as diabetes. In 1989, ophthalmologists in India found that eye drops made from the spice turmeric, known as Haridra in India, uh, seemed to work just as well as antibiotic eye drops in the treatment of conjunctivitis, or pink eye. So researchers decided to give turmeric a try against more serious inflammatory eye diseases like uveitis, which blinds tens of thousands of Americans every year. Uveitis is often an autoimmune or infectious inflammation of the central structures in the eye. Steroids to knock down people's immune systems are the standard treatment, but carry a slew of side effects. So researchers tried giving uveitis sufferers oral supplements of curcumin, the yellow pigment in turmeric, thought responsible in part for the spice's anti-inflammatory effects. 18 patients given curcumin alone, and all 18 improved. Efficacy comparable to corticosteroid therapy, but without any side effects. A larger follow-up study was similarly encouraging 106 patients, all of which had a uveitis relapse in the year before starting curcumin, but in the year after, only 19 did. Altogether, the 106 patients relapsed 275 times in the year before, so multiple relapses, but in the year on curcumin, a total of just 36. Well, if turmeric curcumin works for mild eye inflammation and serious eye inflammation, what about really serious eye inflammation? Idiopathic inflammatory orbital pseudotumors. Uh, let's break that down. Idiopathic means doctors have no idea what causes it, from the Greek idios, as in idiot. Inflammatory, orbital, referring to the bony cavity that houses our eyeball, and pseudotumor, as in not really a tumor. But a lot has changed since this was published in 2000. Inflammatory orbital pseudotumor is now generally attributed to low-grade non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, so it does actually appear to be a form of cancer. Well, what can curcumin do about it? They decided to look at the spice compounds because the available treatments are so toxic— steroids, radiation, chemotherapy. In fact, initially, all the patients in the study were put on steroids, but had to stop them because they either didn't work or had to be withdrawn because of complications. And they didn't want to use radiation because they didn't want to blind anyone. But you got to do something. All the patients had such swelling that they couldn't move their eye as they normally would. If only there was some cheap, simple, safe solution. Four out of the five patients who completed the study had a full response, defined as complete recovery with no residual signs or symptoms. Actually, complete regression of the eye dislocation and swelling occurred in all five out of five patients, though one of the patients continued to suffer some residual effects. Soy foods have become controversial in recent years, even among health professionals, exacerbated by misinformation found on the Internet. Chief among the misconceptions is that soy foods promote breast cancer because they contain a class of phytoestrogen compounds called isoflavones. Since estrogens can promote breast cancer growth, it's natural to assume phytoestrogens might too, but people don't realize there are two types of estrogen receptors in the body, alpha and beta. And unlike actual estrogens, soy phytoestrogens preferentially bind to and activate estrogen receptor beta. This distinction is important because the two types of receptors have different tissue distributions and often function differently, and sometimes in opposite ways. And this appears to be the case in the breast, where beta activation has an anti-estrogenic effect, inhibiting the growth-promoting effects of actual estrogen. Uh, something we've known for more than 10 years. There's no excuse anymore. The effects of estradiol, the primary human estrogen, on breast cells are completely opposite to those of soy, phytoestrogens, which have anti-proliferative effects on breast cancer cells, even at the low concentrations one gets in one's bloodstream eating just a few servings of soy, which makes sense given that after eating a cup of soybeans, the levels in our blood cause significant beta receptor activation. 
So where did this outdated notion that soy could increase breast cancer risk come from? The concern was based largely on research that showed that the main soy phytoestrogen genistein stimulates the growth of mammary tumors in a type of mouse. But it turns out we're not actually mice. We metabolize soy isoflavones very differently from rodents. The same soy leads to 20 to 150 times higher levels in the bloodstream of rodents. The breast cancer mouse in question was 58 times higher. So if you ate 58 cups of soybeans a day, you could get some significant alpha activation too. But thankfully, we're not hairless athymic overreactomized mice, and we don't tend to eat 58 cups of soybeans a day. At just a few servings of soy a day, with the excess beta activation, we would assume soy would actively help prevent breast cancer, and indeed, soy intake during childhood, adolescence, and adult life were each associated with a decreased risk of breast cancer. Those women who ate the most soy in their youth appear to grow up to have less than half the risk. This may help explain why breast cancer rates are so much higher here than in Asia, yet when Asians come over to the U.S. to start eating and living like Americans, their risk shoots right up. For example, women in Connecticut, way up the top of the breast cancer risk heap, in their 50s have like 10 times more breast cancer than women in their 50s living in Japan. But it's not just genetics, since when they move here, their breast cancer rates go up generation after generation as they assimilate into our culture. Are the anti-estrogenic effects of soy foods enough to actually change the course of the disease? We didn't know until the first human study on soy food intake and breast cancer survival was published in 2009 in the Journal of the American Medical Association, suggesting that among women with breast cancer, soy food consumption was significantly associated with decreased risk of death and breast cancer recurrence, followed by another study, and then another, all with similar findings. That was enough for the American Cancer Society, who brought together a wide range of cancer experts to offer nutrition guidelines for cancer survivors, concluding that if anything, soy food should be beneficial. And since then, two additional studies have been published for a total of five, and they all point in the same direction, five out of five, tracking more than 10,000 breast cancer patients. Pooling all the results, Soy food intake after breast cancer diagnosis was associated with reduced mortality, meaning a longer lifespan and reduced recurrence, so less likely the cancer comes back. Anyone who says otherwise hasn't cracked a journal open in seven years. And this improved survival was for both women with estrogen receptor negative tumors and estrogen receptor positive tumors, and for both younger women and for older women, pass the edamame. Five studies have been performed on breast cancer survival and soy foods, involving more than 10,000 breast cancer patients, and those who eat more soy live longer and have a lower risk of the cancer coming back. But what about women who carry breast cancer genes? Uh, fewer than 10% of breast cancer cases run in families, but uh, when they do, it's most likely mutations to one of the tumor suppressor genes, BRCA1 or BRCA2 that defend the integrity of our genes. They're involved in DNA repair, and so if either one of them is damaged, ha has mutations, chromosomal abnormalities can result, which can set us up for cancer. Uh, this idea that we had tumor suppressor genes goes back to famous research in the 60s that showed that if you fuse together a normal cell with a cancer cell, the cancer cell doesn't turn the normal cell malignant. Rather, the normal cell suppresses the cancerous one. Tumor suppressor genes are typically split up into two types. They're gatekeeper genes that keep cancer cells in check, and caretaker genes that keep the cell from going cancerous in the first place. And BRCA genes appear able to do both. That's why their function is so important. Until recently, dietary recommendations for those with mutations uh, focused on reducing DNA damage caused by free radicals, by eating you know, lots of antioxidant-packed foods, fruits and vegetables. If your DNA repair capacity is low, you want to be extra careful about damaging your DNA in the first place. But what if we could also boost BRCA function? In my video on the topic, 
the last one I did, I showed how in vitro soy phytoestrogens could turn back on BRCA protection suppressed by breast cancer, upregulating BRCA expression as much as 1,000% within 48 hours. But does that translate out of the Petri dish and into the person? Apparently so. Soy intake was only associated with 27% breast cancer risk reduction in people with normal BRCA genes, but a 73% risk reduction in carriers of BRCA gene mutations. So a healthy diet may be particularly important in those at high genetic risk. Uh, meat consumption, for example, was linked to twice as much risk in those with BRCA mutations, 97% increased risk instead of just 41% increased risk of breast cancer in those with normal BRCA genes. So uh, same dietary advice, but just more important when there's more risk. Endometriosis is a major cause of disability and compromised quality of life among women. A chronic disease, which is underdiagnosed, underreported, under-researched, uh, for patients it can be a nightmare of misinformation, myths, taboos, lack of diagnosis, and problematic hit-and-miss treatments overlaid by a painful chronic stubborn disease. Pain is what best characterizes the disease. Pain, painful intercourse, heavy irregular periods, and infertility. About one in a dozen young women suffer, and it accounts for about half the cases of pelvic pain and infertility. It's caused by what's called retrograde menstruation. Instead of the blood going down, it goes up into the abdominal cavity, where bleeding tissue of the uterine lining can implant onto other organs. You can have the lesion surgically removed, but the recurrence rate within five years is as high as 50%. Now, endometriosis is an estrogen-dependent disease, so might the anti-estrogenic effects of the phytoestrogens and flaxseeds and soy foods help, as they appear to in breast cancer? I couldn't find studies on flax, but soy food consumption may indeed reduce the risk of endometriosis, but I couldn't find any studies on treating the disease with soy. Uh, there's another food, though, associated with decreased breast cancer risk— seaweed. Seaweeds have special types of fiber and phytonutrients not found among land plants. So it's, it's not like choosing to get your beta-carotene from carrots versus a sweet potato. If you want these unique seaweed components, uh, some of which may have anti-cancer properties, we need to find a way to incorporate sea vegetables into our diets. Anti-cancer properties, such as anti-estrogen effects. Uh, Japanese women have among the lowest rates of breast, endometrial, and ovarian cancers. They have longer menstrual cycles and lower estrogen levels circulating in their blood, and that may help account for their low risk of estrogen-dependent cancers. Uh, we assumed this was their soy intake, but the seaweed might be helping as well. You can drip seaweed broth on human ovary cells that make estrogen and see estrogen levels drop because it's either inhibiting production or facilitating breakdown of estrogen, and may even block estrogen receptors, lowering the activity of the estrogen you do produce. This is in a petri dish, though, but it happens in women as well. They estimate that an effective estrogen-lowering dose of seaweed for an average American woman might be around 5 grams a day, but no one has apparently tried testing it on cancer patients yet. Uh, but it has been tried on endometriosis. Three women with abnormal cycles, two of which with endometriosis, volunteered to add a tiny amount of dried powdered bladderwrack, uh, common seaweed, to their daily diet. It effectively lengthened their cycles and reduced the duration of their periods, and not just by a little. Check out subject number one, a 30-year history of irregular periods, averaging every 16 days, but adding just a teaspoon, a quarter teaspoon of this seaweed powder a day, added 10 days onto her cycle, up to 26 days, and a half teaspoon a day brought her up to like 31, nearly doubling the length of her cycle, and they all experienced marked reductions in blood flow and a decreased duration of menstruation. Uh, poor subject number one was having periods every 16 days that lasted nine days long. Can you imagine? After 30 years of this kind of craziness, just a half teaspoon of seaweed a day, and she was having periods just once a month and only lasting about four days. And most importantly, 
In the two women suffering from endometriosis, they reported substantial alleviation of their pain. How is that possible? Look at their drop in estrogen levels. A 75% drop after just a quarter teaspoon of seaweed powder a day, 85% after a half teaspoon. Now, obviously with just a couple women, no control group, we have to do you know, bigger, better studies, but look when this study was published. More than a decade ago, and not a single such study has been published since. Uh, does the research world just not care about women? Millions of women are suffering with these conditions. Who's going to fund it, though? Uh, that much seaweed costs less than five pennies, uh, so a larger study may never be done. But with no downsides, I would suggest endometriosis sufferers give it a try. Type 1 diabetes arises following the autoimmune destruction of the insulin-producing cells of the pancreas. It's often diagnosed in children and adolescents, who usually present with a classic trio of symptoms— excessive thirst, hunger, and urination— as their blood sugars spike, and they need to go on insulin for the rest of their lives, since their own immune system attacked and destroyed their own ability to produce it. What would cause our body to do such a thing? Whatever it is, it's on the rise around the world, starting after World War II. Understanding why and how the current pandemic of childhood diabetes was produced would be an important step towards reversing it. A plausible guess is that of so-called molecular mimicry, whereby a foreign antibody generated like a bacteria or virus provokes an immune response which cross-reacts with a similar-looking protein on our own pancreas, uh, such that when we attack the bug, our own organ gets caught in the crossfire. OK, so what pancreatic proteins are type 1 diabetics self-attacking? In the 80s, a protein was identified, uh, which in the 90s we realized looked an awful lot like a certain mycobacterial protein. Mycobacteria are a family of bacteria that causes diseases like tuberculosis and leprosy, and all newly diagnosed type 1 diabetic children were found to have immune responses to this mycobacterial protein, but that didn't make any sense. I mean, type 1 diabetes is going up in the industrialized world, whereas you know, TB and leprosy rates are going down. Well, there is one mycobacterial infection in livestock that shot up with the industrialization and globalization of animal agriculture, called paratuberculosis, which causes Yoni's disease in animals, now recognized as a global problem for the livestock industry. Huh, weren't there like a dozen studies suggesting that exposure to cow's milk may be an important determinant of subsequent type 1 diabetes in childhood? Putting two and two together, an idea was put forward in 2006. Could mycobacterium paratuberculosis be a trigger for type 1 diabetes? It was a compelling enough idea that researchers decided to put it to the test. They attempted to test the association of MAP, the full name for the bug, mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis, with type 1 diabetes by testing diabetics for the presence of the bacteria in their blood. And lo and behold, most of the diabetic patients were found positive for the bug, compared to only a minority of the healthy control subjects. This evidence of MAP bacteria in the blood of patients with type 1 diabetes might provide an important foundation in establishing an infectious cause for type 1 diabetes. Uh, these results might have implications for countries that have the greatest livestock populations and a high incidence of both MAP and diabetes, like the United States. Yoni's disease is what you call the disease when livestock get infected by the bug. Uh, the reason the diabetes researchers chose Sardinia, an island off the coast of Italy, is because paratuberculosis is present in more than 50% of Sardinian herds. If they think that's bad, though, the last national survey of dairy herds in the U.S. shows 68% are, are infected with MAP, especially those big industrial dairies. 95% of operations with more than 500 cows came up positive. It's estimated the disease cost the U.S. industry more than a billion dollars a year. How do people become exposed? The most important routes of access of MAP into the human food chain appear to be contaminated milk, milk products, and meat from infected cattle, sheep, and goats. MAP, or MAP DNA, has been detected in both raw milk and pasteurized milk, infant formula, cheese, ice cream, muscle and organ tissues, and retail meat. 
How do we know Power-T B bacteria survive pasteurization? Because Wisconsin researchers bought hundreds of pints of retail milk off store shelves from three of our top milk-producing states and tested for the presence of viable, meaning living MAP bacteria in retail milk, and 2.8% came back positive for live Power-T B bacteria with most brands yielding at least one positive sample, so it can survive pasteurization. If Para-TB does end up being a diabetes trigger, then these findings indicate that retail milk in the United States would need to be considered as a transmission vector. Why hasn't the public heard about this research? Perhaps because the industry isn't too keen on sharing. This is from the Journal of Dairy Science. Fear of consumer reaction can impede rational, open discussion of scientific studies. Mycobacterium paratuberculosis is not just a serious problem for the global livestock industry, but maybe a trigger for type 1 diabetes, given that paratb bacteria have been found in the bloodstream of the majority of type 1 diabetics tested, presumably exposed through the retail milk supply, as they can survive pasteurization. But what about the meat supply? Mycobacterium paratuberculosis has been found in beef, pork, and chicken. It's an intestinal bug, and unfortunately, fecal contamination of the carcass in the slaughter plant is simply unavoidable. And then unless it's cooked well done, it could harbor living Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis bacteria. Meat-wise, ground beef may represent the greatest potential risk for harboring these paratuberculosis bacteria, as a significant proportion originates from cold dairy cattle, which may be cold because they have paratuberculosis, and go straight into the human food chain. There's also a greater prevalence of fecal contamination and lymph nodes in ground meat, and the grinding can force the bacteria deep inside the burger. Given the weight of evidence and the severity and magnitude of potential human health problems, the precautionary principle suggests that it's time to take actions to limit human exposure to this pathogen. In the very least, we should stop funneling animals known to be infected into the human food supply. We know that milk exposure is associated with type 1 diabetes, but what about meat? An attempt was made to tease out the nutritional factors that could help account for the 350-fold variation in type 1 diabetes rates around the world. Why do some parts of the world have hundreds of times higher rates than others? Yes, the more dairy populations ate, the higher the rates of type 1 diabetes. But the same was found for meat, lending credibility to the speculation that the increasing dietary supply of animal protein after World War II may have contributed to the increasing incidence of type 1 diabetes. And there was a negative correlation, meaning a protective correlation, between the intake of grains and type 1 diabetes, which may fit within the more general context of a lower prevalence of chronic diseases among those eating more plant-based. And the increase in meat consumption over time appeared to parallel the increasing incidence of the disease. Now, you always have to be really cautious about the interpretation of these country-by-country -country comparisons, since just because a country eats a particular way doesn't mean that the individuals that get the disease ate that way. For example, a similar study looking specifically at the diets of children and adolescents between different countries supported the previous research about the importance of cow's milk and animal products and the cause of type 1 diabetes, but they also found that in countries where they tend to eat the most sugar, kids tend to have lower rates of the disease. Now, this didn't reach statistical significance, since there were so few countries, but even if it had, and, and even if there were other studies to back it up, there are a million factors that could be going on. Right? Maybe countries that ate the least sugar ate the most high fructose corn syrup or something. You always got to put it to the test. If you analyze the diets of what people who actually got the disease ate, Increased risk of type 1 diabetes has been associated with milk, sugar, bread, soda, egg, and meat intake. In Sardinia, where the original link was made between Para-TB and type 1 diabetes, a highly statistically significant dose-response relationship was found, meaning more meat, more risk, especially during the first two years of the child's life. So high meat consumption seems to be an important early-in-life cofactor 
for type 1 diabetes development, although we need more data. The latest such study, following thousands of mother-child pairs, found that eating meat during breastfeeding was associated with an increased risk of both preclinical and full-blown type 1 diabetes by the time their child reached age 8. They thought it may be the glycotoxins, the AGEs found in cooked meat, which can be transferred through breastfeeding, but, but what can also be transferred through human breast milk are paratuberculosis bacteria which have been grown from the breast milk of women with Crohn's disease, another autoimmune disease linked to paratuberculosis bacteria exposure. The compelling finding of MAP bacteria circulating disproportionately within the bloodstream of type 1 diabetics was subsequently confirmed by culturing it straight out of their blood. But just because being infected and type 1 diabetes appeared to go together, we don't know which came first. Yes, maybe infection made kids more susceptible to diabetes, but maybe the diabetes made kids more susceptible to infection. Maybe this bug just likes hanging out in sugary blood. In that case, we might expect to see it in type 2 diabetics too, but no, paratuberculosis infection is not associated with type 2 diabetes, which would make sense since type 2 is not an autoimmune disease. For this infectious trigger idea to be sound, there would have to be an immune response mounted to the bug, and indeed there is an extremely significant antibody response against paratuberculosis bacteria in type 1 diabetics. But do the antibodies attacking the bug cross-react with our own insulin-producing cells to generate that autoimmune reaction? Apparently so. Antibodies recognizing the molecular signatures of mycobacterium paratuberculosis cross-react with the molecular signatures present on our insulin-producing beta cells in our pancreas. OK, but is this just in Sardinia, or might we find these same results elsewhere? The same results were found on mainland Italy with a group of type 1 diabetics with different genetic backgrounds, a strong association between para-TB bacteria exposure and type 1 diabetes, and then confirmed again and again in other pediatric populations, as well as a group of type 1 diabetic adults. The paratuberculosis bacteria also explains why type 1 diabetes risk is associated with a specific gene on chromosome 2 called SLC11A1. What does that gene do? It activates the immune cell that eats mycobacteria for breakfast. So that could explain how a mutation in that gene could increase the susceptibility to type 1 diabetes, by increasing the susceptibility to mycobacterial infections like Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis, all part of this accumulating line of evidence pointing to it as a trigger for the development of type 1 diabetes. And it's no coincidence. These types of bacteria have evolved to disguise themselves to look like human proteins for the express purpose of avoiding detection by our immune system. These are not the droids you're looking for. But if our immune systems see through the disguise and starts attacking the bacteria, our similar-looking proteins can become a victim of friendly fire, which is what these studies have all been pointing to, or almost all. This 2015 review found that all 7 out of 7 human studies found an association between type 1 diabetes and paratuberculosis exposure, but it's actually only 7 out of 8. Since that review, a study in India was published finding no link. A few possible explanations were offered. Maybe it's because they have compulsory vaccination for regular TB, which might cr offer cross-protection against paratuberculosis as it does with leprosy. Or maybe because they eat so much less meat. Or maybe it's because of their compulsory boiling of milk before consumption. If you measure the heat inactivation of milk with high concentrations of naturally infected feces, which is probably the main source of milk contamination, pasteurization may not completely inactivate the bacteria, but sterilization at boiling temperatures should, though this might depend on the degree of fecal clumping. Uh, that may be one way MAP bacteria write out pasteurization by hiding in tiny fecal clumps in milk. But only rarely should MAP survive over 100 degrees Celsius, perhaps explaining the disparate India findings. Bottom line, to reduce human exposure to MAP via consumption of meat and dairy products, 
more studies are needed for estimating how much MAP there is in milk, meat, and feces, and how much feces is in the milk and meat, to figure out what we need to do to kill it. In the meanwhile, what's the potential public health impact of mycobacterium paratuberculosis? The majority of specialists in the field agree that it's likely a risk to human health and should be a high or medium priority public health issue. Salt is considered a probable cause of stomach cancer, one of the world's leading cancer killers. If their estimate of an 8% increase in risk for every extra gram of salt a day is correct, then in a country like the UK, nearly 1,700 cases of stomach cancer happen every year just because of excess salt intake and in a country like the U.S. it would be thousands more every year. The risk of stomach cancer associated with salt intake appears on par with smoking or heavy alcohol use, but may only be half as bad as opium use or increased total meat consumption, based on this study of more than a half million people, which may explain why those eating meatless diets appear to have nearly two-thirds lower risk. We know dietary salt intake is directly associated with the risk of stomach cancer, and the higher the intake, the higher the risks. But this meta-analysis went further, looking at specific salt-rich foods— pickled foods, salted fish, processed meat, and miso soup. Habitual consumption of Pickled foods, salted fish, and processed meat were each associated with about a 25% greater risk of stomach cancer. The pickled foods may explain why Korea appears to have the highest stomach cancer rates in the world. But there was no significant association with the consumption of miso soup. This may be because the carcinogenic effects of the salt are counteracted by the anti-carcinogenic effects of the soy, effectively canceling out the risk. And if we made garlicky soup with some scallions thrown in, it may drop our cancer risk even lower. But cancer isn't the primary reason people are told to avoid salt. What about miso soup and high blood pressure? Well, it may be the same kind of thing. The salt in miso is squeezing our blood pressures up, but the soy protein in miso may be relaxing our blood pressures down. So, for example, if you compare the effects of soy milk to cow's milk, and to make it fairer, compare soy milk to skim milk to avoid the saturated butterfat, soy milk can much more dramatically improve blood pressure among women with hypertension. But would the effect be dramatic enough to counter all the salt in miso? Japanese researchers decided to put it to the test. They followed men and women in their 60s, who started out with normal blood pressure, and followed them for four years to see who was more likely to be diagnosed with hypertension in that time, those who had two or more bowls of miso soup a day, or those who had one or less. Uh, two bowls a day would be like adding a half teaspoon of salt to one's daily diet, yet those who ate two bowls or more appeared to have five times lower risk of becoming hypertensive. So maybe the anti-hypertensive effects of the soy in the miso exceeds the hypertensive effects of the salt. One of the reasons fruits and vegetables may be so good for us are the antioxidant compounds they contain, given the role that oxidant-free radicals are thought to play in aging and disease. So if you're making a salad, for example, using spinach or arugula, or red leaf lettuce may offer twice the antioxidants of butterhead lettuce. And then choosing purple cabbage over green, or red onions over white, you can help boost the antioxidant power of your salad. But fresh herbs are so powerful, even a little bit could double or quadruple the antioxidant power of the entire meal. Here's the total antioxidants in a simple salad, lettuce and tomato. And then here's that same salad with just a tablespoon of lemon balm leaves, or could be a half of a tablespoon of oregano or mint. And here's marjoram country, thyme or sage, effectively quadrupling the antioxidant content of the salad and making it 
yummier at the same time. And that's not to mention maybe a little fresh garlic or ginger in the dressing. Herbs are so antioxidant-rich that researchers decided to see if they might be able to reduce the DNA-damaging effects of radiation with them. Radioactive iodine is sometimes given to people with overactive thyroid glands, or thyroid cancer, to destroy part of the gland or mop up any remaining tumor cells after surgery. Uh, for days after the isotope injection, patients become so radioactive that they are advised not to kiss anyone or to sleep close to anyone, including your pets. If you breathe on a phone, make sure to wipe it off. Don't splatter radioactive urine. Don't go near your kids, and basically stay away from others as much as possible. The treatment can be very effective, but all that radiation exposure appears to increase the risk of developing new cancers later on. So, to prevent the DNA damage associated with this treatment, researchers test the ability of oregano to protect chromosomes of human blood cells in vitro from exposure to radioactive iodine. At baseline, about 1 in 100 of our blood cells show evidence of chromosomal damage. Add some radioactive iodine, though, and it's more like 1 in 8. But then add, in addition to the radiation, increasing amounts of oregano extract, and chromosome damage was reduced by as much as 70%. They conclude that oregano extract significantly protects against DNA damage induced by the radioactive iodine in white blood cells. Uh, but this was all done outside the body, and they justify it by saying, look, it wouldn't be particularly ethical to irradiate people for experimental research, but you know, look, millions of people have been irradiated for treatment, so they could have used them, or at least just had people eat the oregano instead, and then just irradiate their blood in vitro to modeled the amount of oregano compounds that would actually make it into the bloodstream. Other in vitro studies on oregano are similarly kind of unsatisfying in a compares, comparison of the effects of various spice extracts, bay leaves, fennel, lavender, oregano, paprika, parsley, rosemary, and thyme. Oregano beat out all but bay leaves in its ability to suppress cervical cancer cell growth in vitro while leaving normal cells alone, and they've got you know, pretty pictures of oregano killing off cervical cancer cells, but people tend to use oregano orally, so the relevance of these results are not clear. Similarly, the closely related herb marjoram can suppress the growth of individual breast cancer cells in a petri dish, and even effectively whole human breast tumors grown in chicken eggs. Never seen that before. But the, whole, the only clinical trial I could find on oregano family herbs, the only randomized controlled study on actual people, was this study on the effect of marjoram tea on the hormonal profile of women with polycystic ovary syndrome. PCOS is the most common cause of fertility problems in women, affecting about 1 in 8 young women. It's characterized by excessive male hormones, resulting in excess body or facial hair, menstrual irregularities, and cysts in one's ovaries on ultrasound. Evidently, traditional medicine practitioners reported marjoram tea was beneficial, but it had never been put to the test until now. Two cups a day versus a placebo tea for one month, and there did seem to be beneficial effects on the hormonal profiles, and so uh, that would seem to offer credence to the claims of the traditional medicine practitioners. Uh, but the study didn't last long enough to confirm that actual symptoms improve as well. That's what we care about. Is there anything that's been shown to help? Well, reducing one's intake of dietary glycotoxins may help prevent and treat the disease. Over the last two decades, there's been increasing evidence supporting an important contribution from food-derived advanced glycation end products, AGEs, also known as glycotoxins, to increased oxidative stress and inflammation processes that play a major role in the causation of chronic diseases, including, potentially, polycystic ovary syndrome. Women with PCOS tend to have nearly twice the circulating AGE levels in their bloodstream. Polycystic ovary syndrome may be the most common hormonal abnormality among young women in the United States, a common cause of infertility, menstrual dysfunction, and excess facial and body hair. Now, the prevalence of obesity is also higher in women with PCOS, and so since the highest AGE levels are found in broiled, grilled, fried, and roasted foods of mostly animal origin. Is it possible that this causal chain starts with the bad diet, like lots of fried chicken, 
which leads to obesity, which then in turn leads to PCOS. So what we eat maybe is only indirectly related to PCOS through weight gain. No, because the same link between high AG levels and PCOS was found in lean women as well. As chronic inflammation and increased oxidative stress have been incriminated in the disease process of PCOS, so the role of AGEs as pro-inflammatory, pro-oxidant mediators may indeed be linked with the metabolic and reproductive abnormalities of the syndrome, and further, the buildup of AGE inside polycystic ovaries themselves uh, suggests the potential role of AGEs contributing to the disease process itself beyond just some of the consequences. Rage is highly expressed in ovarian tissues. In other words, the receptor, that's the R in rage. The receptor in the body for these advanced glycation end products is concentrated for some reason in the ovaries, so ovaries may be particularly sensitive to their effects. So AGEs might indeed be contributing to the cause of polycystic ovary syndrome and infertility, so should we just cut down on meat, cheese, and eggs? Or we can always come up with AGE absorption blocking drugs. We know AGEs have been implicated in the development of many chronic diseases. Specifically, food-derived AGEs play an important role. Diet is a major source of these pro-inflammatory AGEs. Indeed, cutting down on these dietary glycotoxins reduces the inflammatory response, but stewed chicken just doesn't taste as good as fried chicken, so therefore you can have your KFC and eat it too. Just take this drug with it every time you eat to cut down on the absorption of these toxins and it works. It actually lowers AGE blood levels. This oral absorbent drug, AST120, is just a preparation of activated charcoal. Uh, that's what like, you like give for you know, drug overdoses and when people are poisoned. Uh, I'm, I'm sure if you, if you took some Ipecac with your KFC, your levels would go down too. You know, there's another way you can reduce your absorption by reducing your intake in the first place. Simple, safe, feasible. The first thing you do is stop smoking. Uh, the glycotoxins in cigarette sm smoke may contribute to the increase in heart disease and cancer among smokers. Then you can decrease your intake of high AGE foods, while increasing your intake of foods that may help pull AGEs out of your system, like brown rice and mushrooms. And we can eat foods high in antioxidants, like berries, herbs, and spices. Dietary AGE intake can be decreased even just by simply changing the method of cooking from the high-temperature dry cooking methods to low heat, higher humidity. In other words, moving away from broiling, searing, frying, to more stewing, steaming, and boiling. But what we eat may be more important than how we cook it. For example, boiled chicken has less than half the glycotoxins of roasted chicken, but even deep-fried potatoes has less than boiled meat. We could also eat foods raw, which doesn't work as well for blood pudding, but we can choose raw nuts and nut butters, uh, which may have 30 times less glycotoxins than roasted, and we can stay, from, stay away from high AGE processed foods such as puffed, shredded, and flaked breakfast cereals. Why does it matter? Because study after study has shown that switching someone to a low AGE diet can lower the inflammation within their bodies. Even just a single high AGE meal can profoundly impair our artery function within just two hours of consumption. Uh, fried or broiled chicken breast and veggies compared to steamed or boiled chicken breast and veggies. The same ingredients, just different cooking methods. Uh, now you'll notice that even the steamed or boiled chicken meal still impaired arterial function, so you could certainly choose to eat even healthier, but significantly better than the fried or broiled. Ironically, the amount of AGEs administered during this high AGE intervention, this profoundly impair your artery function amount of AGEs, was similar to the average estimated daily intake by the general population, the standard American diet. That's why you can decrease inflammation in people putting them on a low AGE diet, but an increase in inflammation was less apparent when people switched from their regular diet to a high AGE diet because they're already eating a high AGE diet, so many of these glycotoxins in their regular diet. Do we have evidence reducing AGE intake actually helps with polycystic ovaries? Yes, within just two months. Baseline diet, switch to a high AGE diet to a low AGE diet, 
and you see parallel changes in insulin sensitivity, oxidative stress, hormonal status, with the take-home being that those with PCOS may want to try a low AGE diet, which in the study meant restricting meat to once a week that's only boiled, poached, stewed, st or steamed, and cutting out fast food type uh, foods and soda. Uh, what about instead of steamed chicken, we ate no meat at all? Rather than measuring blood levels, which vary with each meal, uh, like if you just ate some roasted nuts or something, um, we can measure the level of glycotoxins stuck in your body tissues over time instead with a fancy gizmo that measures the amount of light your skin gives off, because AGEs are fluorescent. And so no surprise, this turns out to be a strong predictor of overall mortality, so the lower the better. And the one factor consistently associated with reduced skin fluorescence, this reduced AGEs coming out of your body, um, was a vegetarian diet, which suggests that eating more plant-based may reduce exposure to these preformed dietary AGEs, potentially reducing tissue AGEs as well as chronic disease risk. Nearly everybody has experienced hiccups, but what exactly are they? The, uh, the idea that a hiccup is just a simple muscle spasm of the diaphragm was apparently disproved over 40 years ago, and instead involves a complex orchestrated pattern of muscle contractions. Uh, but why? It may be a leftover from the womb. Uh, during fetal life, hiccups are universally present, their incidence peaking in the third trimester, suggesting hiccups might represent a necessary and vital primitive reflex that would permit in-the-womb training of the breathing muscles without choking on the amniotic fluid. In adulthood, nearly anything can trigger hiccups. Case in point, 19-year-old woman with persistent hiccups, physical exam was normal, except there was an ant crawling on her eardrum. The ant was removed, and the hiccups stopped. And there appear to be as many cures as there are causes, as the famous Dr. Mayo put it. The less we know about something, the more treatments we seem to have for it, and perhaps no disease had more forms of treatment than the persistent hiccup. There's drugs, of course. There's always lots of drugs, from Thorazine to apomorphine. Uh, but there's also a whole slew of non-pharmacological approaches, from uh, breathing into a paper bag and uh, drinking from the foreside of a glass, to smearing mustard onto your tummy. You'll note many of these quote-unquote remedies have not been tested, and some appear to have been invented purely for the amusement of the patient's friends. Uh, this uh, first one here, forcible traction of the tongue, which means pulling on someone's tongue, Attributed to the great Dr. Osler, the uh, first chief physician at Johns Hopkins, uh, but the therapy dates back earlier to perhaps, not surprisingly, French origins. Another trick that might work is a modified Heimlich maneuver with just moderate pressure, three thrusts, and the hiccups were gone. In general, though, treatments are disappointing. Hundreds of remedies have been tried, but none have been found to be regularly curative. You know doctors are getting desperate when they start suggesting things like chilling of the earlobe, and you know doctors are really getting desperate when they have to tack on to the end prayer. This is the paper that started me down the hiccup rabbit hole. I was reviewing the latest research on vinegar and stumbled across this. After the failure of common treatments for hiccups, the patients patient was given a sip of vinegar, and his hiccups stopped after just a single sip. Sour tastes, such as vinegar and lemon, have evidently been used to treat hiccups since the 1930s, but non-pharmacological remedies, such as vinegar, fell out of favor with the widespread use of drugs. After all, how much can you charge for a sip of vinegar? Worst comes to worst, there's surgery, the phrenic nerve crush, which is as bad as it sounds, but before you go down that route, you'd be surprised how many patients with hiccups respond to digital compression of the eyeballs. Uh, digit as in finger, as in like pushing your thumbs into someone's eyeballs as a counter-irritation measure. That'll get their mind off of their hiccups. And if that doesn't distract them enough, there's always digital rectal massage. 
A 27-year-old man presents to the ER with intractable hiccups. They try massaging other places. Uh, they try the digital eyeball compression. Nothing really seemed to do it, so bend over. Digital rectal massage was then attempted using a slow circumferential motion, and it worked. So before giving people drugs, maybe we should be giving patients a massage. It's easy to perform, and maybe less dangerous than sticking your fingers into people's eye sockets, which if you're in medical school and have to memorize all these stupid names, is known as the dagnini ashner maneuver. Medicine loves its eponyms. Speaking of maneuvers, how's this for a pickup line? Hey, want to help cure my hiccups? On the fourth day of continuous hiccuping, with spousal help, the patient's hiccups vanished at the point of climax. It's unclear, the doctor wrote, whether orgasm in women leads to a similar resolution. An issue, he said, would, <laughs> would have to be investigated further, and it was back in 1845, in an infamous, disturbing case report amounting to effectively bragging about sexual assault published in what was to become the New England Journal of Medicine. Young religious woman with intractable hiccups fell into the hands of a Dr. George Dexter, who first attempted the best modern medicine could offer, bloodletting. She still hiccuped, though, until he pressed his hand on her genitals for a few minutes, and it apparently worked. This went on for month after month, frequently calling upon his colleagues to exhibit to them this singular phenomenon. Who was this guy? Although his interaction with a young female patient would not meet today's ethical standards, you could say that again, his medical observation was considered value, valid, though rectal massage and sexual stimulation may help. This uh, kind of recommendation should probably be reserved, this research review continues, uh, concluded for carefully selected patients. There are all manner of purported hiccup cures, everything from chew a lemon, inhale pepper, or our dog's favorite, a spoonful of peanut butter. Here's the technique uh, I'm excited to try next time I get hiccups. Supra, supra maximal inspiration. You take a very deep breath, hold for 10 seconds, then breathe in even more, hold for another 5 seconds, then one final tiny breath in, and hold for 5 last seconds. An immediate and permanent termination to hiccups was achieved. When I was a kid, I taught myself how to control my own hiccups using slow-paced breathing, and I was excited to see there was finally a case report written up on it. Uh, it's really neat. There's a nerve called the vagus nerve that goes directly from our brain to our chest to our stomach and connects our brain back and forth to our heart and our gut and even our immune system. The vagus nerve is like the hard wiring that allows our brain to turn down inflammation within our body. When you hear about the mind-body connection, that's what the vagus nerve is and does. So there's been increasing interest in treating a wide range of disorders with implanted pacemaker-like devices for stimulating vagus nerve pathways. But certain Eastern traditions like yoga, qigong, and zen figured a way to do it without having electrodes implanted into your body. Let me explain how. A healthy heart is not a metronome. Your heart rate goes up and down with your breathing. When you breathe in, your heart rate tends to go up. When you breathe out, your heart rate tends to go down. You can pause this video and test it out on yourself right now by feeling your pulse change as you breathe in and out. I'll wait. Isn't that cool? See, that heart rate variability is a measure of vagal tone, the activity of your vagus nerve. And so the game to play next time you're bored is to try to make your heart rate speed up and slow down as much as possible within each breath. This can be done because there's a whole other oscillating cycle going on at the same time that's speeding and slowing your heart rate based on moment-to-moment -moment changes in your blood pressure. And as any physics geek can tell you, all oscillating feedback systems with a constant delay have the characteristic of resonance, meaning you can boost the amplitude if you get the cycles in sync. It's, it's like pushing your kid on a swing. If you get the timing just right, you can boost them higher and higher. Similarly, if you breathe in at just the right frequency, you can force the cycles in sync and boost your heart rate variability. Uh, and uh, why are we doing that again? 
because that allows us to affect the function of our autonomic nervous system via vagal afferents to brainstem nuclei like the locus ceruleus, activating hypothalamic vigilance areas, or at least according to the neurophysiologic model, model postulation. I mean, duh! <laughs> uh, and why are we doing this again? It's not just to cure hiccups. Practicing slow breathing a few minutes a day may have lasting beneficial effects on a number of medical and emotional disorders, including asthma, irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, and depression, though in the US of A, we've put it to use improving batting performance in baseball. Now, to date, most studies have lacked proper controls and have used fancy biofeedback machines to determine each person's resonant frequency, but for most people it comes out to be about five and a half breaths per minute so a full breath in and out about every 11 seconds. When musicians were randomized into slow breathing groups with or without biofeedback, slow breathing helped regardless. Same with high blood pressure. You can use this technique to significantly drop your blood pressure within minutes. The hope is if you practice this a few minutes a day, you can have long-lasting effects the rest of the day breathing normally. Uh, practice what exactly? Slow breathing five or six breaths per minute, split equally between breathing in and breathing out. Should do it. So like uh, five seconds in, then five seconds out, all the while breathing shallowly and naturally. You don't want to hyperventilate. Natural, shallow breaths, but just breathing really slowly. Try it. The next time you get hiccups works for me every time. Mainstream medicine has long had a healthy skepticism of dietary supplements extending to the present day. Enough is enough. But this commentary in the Archives of Internal Medicine argued we may have gone too far, as evidenced by our uncritical acceptance of supposed toxicities, the surprisingly angry, scornful tone found in medical texts, with uh, words like careless, useless, indefensible, wasteful, and insidious, as well as ignoring evidence of possible benefit. To illustrate the uncritical acceptance of bad news about supplements, they discussed the well-known concept that high dose of vitamin C can cause kidney stones. Uh, but just because something is well-known in medicine doesn't mean it's necessarily true. They couldn't find a single reported case. We've known that Vitamin C is turned into oxalates in the body, and if the level of oxalates in the urine gets too high, stones can form. But even at 4,000 mg of vitamin C a day, that's like a couple gallons of orange juice worth, urinary oxalates may not get very high, but you know, there may be rare individuals that have increased capacity for this conversion into oxalates, and so a theoretical risk of kidney stones with high-dose vitamin C supplements was raised in a letter printed in a medical journal back in 1973. Okay, but when it's talked about in the medical literature, they make it sound like it's an established phenomenon. Here's a reference to seven citations supposedly suggesting an association between excessive vitamin C intake and the formation of oxalate kidney stones. Let's look at these cited sources. Okay, there's the letter about the theoretical risk. That's legit. But this other citation has nothing to do with either vitamin C or kidney stones, and the other five citations are just references to books, which can sometimes be okay if books cite primary research themselves, but instead there's like this circular logic, where the books just cite other books that like cite that theoretical risk letter again. So it looks like there's a lot of evidence, but they're all just expressing this opinion with no new data. Now, by that time there were actually studies that followed populations of people taking vitamin C supplements and found no increased kidney stone risk among men. Uh, then later women, same thing. Uh, so you can understand this author's frustration that vitamin C supplements appear to be unfairly villainized. The irony is that now we know that vitamin C supplements do indeed appear to increase kidney stone risk. This population of men was followed further out, and men taking vitamin C supplements did indeed end up with higher risk. Confirmed now in a second study, uh, though also of men, uh, we don't know if women are similarly at risk, though there's now also been a case reported of a child also running into problems. What does doubling of risk mean exactly in this context? Uh, that means those taking like 1,000 mg a day 
of vitamin C may have a 1 in 300 chance of getting a kidney stone every year instead of a 1 in 600 chance, which is not an insignificant risk, 1 in 300. Uh, kidney stones can be really painful, so they conclude that, look, since there's no benefits and some risk, better to stay away. But there are benefits. Taking vitamin C just when you get a cold doesn't seem to help, and regular supplement users don't seem to get fewer colds, but when they do get sick, they don't get as sick and get better about 10% faster. And those under extreme physical stress may cut their cold risk in half. So it's really up to each individual to balance the potential common cold benefit with the potential kidney stone risk. The approval of aspartame has a controversial history. The FDA commissioner concluded that there was reasonable certainty that human exposure of aspartame would not pose a risk of brain damage, resulting in mental retardation, hormonal dysfunction, or both, and will not cause brain tumors. However, the FDA's own public board of inquiry withdrew their approval over cancer concerns. Furthermore, several FDA scientists advised against the approval, citing the aspartame company's own brain tumor tests. The commissioner approved aspartame anyway, before he left the FDA and enjoyed a $1,000 a day consultancy position with the aspartame company's PR firm. Then the FDA actually prevented the National Toxicology Program from doing further cancer testing, uh, so we were left with people battling over different rodent studies, some of which showed increased cancer risk and some of which that didn't. Uh, reminds me of the whole saccharin story, where it caused bladder cancer in rats but not mice, leaving us with unanswerable questions like, so are we more like a rat or a mouse? We obviously had to put the aspartame question to the test in people, but the longest human safety study lasted only 18 weeks. We needed better human data. Since the largest rat study highlighted lymphomas and leukemias, the NIH AARP study tracked blood cancer diagnoses, and higher levels of aspartame intake were not associated with the risk of cancer. It's a massive study, uh, but was criticized for only evaluating relatively short-term exposure. Uh, people were only studied for five years hey, better than 18 weeks, but how about 18 years? All eyes then turned to Harvard, which started following the health and diets of medical professionals since before aspartame even came on the market. In the most comprehensive long-term population study to evaluate the association between aspartame intake and cancer risk in humans, they did find an association between both diet soda and total aspartame intake, and the risks of both non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and multiple myeloma in men, and leukemia in both men and women. Um, OK, but why more cancer in men than women? A similar result was found for pancreatic cancer in diet soda, not soda in general. Uh, in fact, the only sugar tied to pancreatic cancer risk was the milk sugar, lactose. Uh, it was the diet soda. So the Male-female discrepancy could have just been a statistical fluke, but they decided to dig a little deeper. Aspartame is broken down into methanol, and the methanol is turned into formaldehyde, a documented human carcinogen, by this enzyme here, alcohol dehydrogenase. The same enzyme that detoxifies regular alcohol is the same enzyme that converts methanol to formaldehyde. Is it possible men just have higher levels of this enzyme than women? Yes, uh, that's why women get higher blood alcohol levels drinking the same amount of alcohol. If you look at liver samples from men and women, there's significantly greater enzyme activity in the men. So maybe that explains the increased cancer risk in men, the higher conversion rates from aspartame to formaldehyde. But how do we test it, though? Well, Ethanol, regular alcohol, competes with methanol for the same enzyme's attention. In fact, regular alcohol is actually used as an antidote for methanol poisoning. Uh, so men who don't drink may have higher formaldehyde conversion rates from aspartame, if this whole formaldehyde theory is correct. And indeed, consistent with this line of reasoning, it was the men that drank the least alcohol that appeared to have the greatest cancer risk from aspartame. A third cohort study has since been published and found no increased lymphoma risk associated with diet soda during a 10-year follow-up period. So no risk detected in the 18-week study, the 5-year study, or the 10-year study, only in the 18-year study. What should we make of all this? 
Well, some have called for a reevaluation of the safety of aspartame. The uh, horse is kind of out of the barn at this point, with 34 million pounds of the stuff produced annually, but that doesn't mean we have to eat it, especially, perhaps, pregnant women and children. Tea consumption is associated with a reduced risk of heart disease, stroke, and premature death in general, with each additional cup of green tea a day associated with a 4% lower mortality risk. Uh, so maybe drinking several cups of tea daily can keep the doctor away, as well as the mortician. Uh, but what about cancer? Uh, there is growing evidence from laboratory population and human interventional studies that tea can exert beneficial disease-preventive effects, and further may actually slow cancer progression. Uh, let's review some of that evidence. Not only do those who drink a lot of tea appear to live years longer than those who drink less, drinking lots of tea may delay the onset of cancer. Uh, now these are in Japanese teacups, which only contain half a cup, so the highest category here is greater than or equal to five full cups of tea, not ten. The women who did get cancer appeared to get it seven years later if they had been drinking lots of tea compared to those who consumed less, whereas men had a three-year delay, the difference male versus female potentially due to smoking habits. Green tea may be able to interfere with each of the stages of cancer formation. The initiation of the first cancer cell, promotion into a tumor, and then the subsequent progression and spread. Uh, cancer is often initiated when a free radical oxidizes our DNA, causing a mutation. But within 40 minutes of drinking green tea, you can get a nice spike in antioxidant power of your bloodstream. Uh, this increase, in turn, may lower oxidative damage to DNA, and so decrease the risk of cancer. Furthermore, in terms of genoprotective effects, protecting our genes Pre-existing oxidation-induced DNA damage was lower after drinking green tea, suggesting that it can boost DNA repair as well. But we didn't know for sure until now. There's a DNA repair enzyme in our body called OGG1, and within one hour of drinking a single cup of green tea, we can boost its activity. Uh, though after a week of tea drinking, we can boost it even higher, so regular intake of green tea may have additional benefits in the prevention and or repair of DNA damage. Tea is so DNA protective it can be used for sperm storage for fresh samples until it can be properly refrigerated. And so anti-inflammatory it can be used for pain control as a mouthwash after wisdom tooth surgery. And in terms of controlling cancer growth, at a dose of green tea compounds that would make it into someone's organs after drinking six cups of tea, it can cause cancer cells to commit suicide. Apoptosis programs cell death while leaving normal cells alone. Now, there's lots of chemo agents that can kill cancer through brute force, but that can make normal cells vulnerable too. So green tea appears to be potentially an ideal agent for cancer prevention. Little or no adverse side effects, efficacious for multiple cancers at achievable dose levels, uh, can be taken orally. Uh, we have a sense of how it works by stopping cancer cells from growing, causing them to off themselves. It's cheap, and has a history of safe, acceptable use. Uh, but this was all based on in vitro studies in a test tube. Uh, it needs to be evaluated in human trials. Give people with cancer green tea to see if it helps. Tea consumption may reduce the risk of getting oral cancer. Uh, not only may the consumption of tea boost the antioxidant power of our bloodstream within minutes of consumption, and decrease the amount of free radical DNA damage throughout our systems over time, can also increase the antioxidant power of our saliva, and decrease the DNA damage within the inner cheek cells of smokers, though not as much as stopping smoking altogether. So might this help precancerous oral lesions from turning into cancerous? oral lesions. More than 100,000 people develop oral cancer annually worldwide, with a five-year overall survival rate of less than the flip of a coin. Oral cancer frequently arises from precancerous lesions in the mouth, which each have a few percent chance every year from turning cancerous, so what a perfect opportunity to see if green tea can help. 
59 patients with precancerous oral lesions were randomized into a tea group in which capsules of powdered tea extract were given, as well as having the lesions painted with the green tea powder, versus a control group that essentially got sugar pills and were painted with nothing. Within six months, lesions in 11 of the 29 in the tea group shrunk, compared to only 3 out of 30 in the placebo group. Uh, the results indicate that tea treatment can improve the clinical manifestations of the oral lesions. The important question, though, is did it prevent them from turning cancerous? Because the trial only lasted a few months, they couldn't tell. But when they scraped some cells off of the lesions, there was a significant drop in DNA-damaged cells within three months in the treatment group, suggesting that things were going in the right direction. Ideally, though, we'd do a longer study to see if they ended up with less cancer. And you know, while we're at it, how about a study where they just used swallowed tea components, since most people don't you know, finger paint with tea in their mouths. We didn't have such a study, though, until we did. Same extraordinary clinical results, with some precancerous lesions shrinking away. And the study lasted long enough to see if fewer people actually got cancer, but there was just as much new cancer in the green tea group as the placebo group. So a higher response rate—I mean, the lesions looked better, but no improvement in cancer-free survival, which is the whole point. Now, these studies were done mostly on smokers and formal smokers. Uh, what about lung cancer? Population studies suggest tea may be protective, but let's put it to the test. 17 patients with advanced lung cancer, given up to the equivalent of like 30 cups of green tea a day, but no objective responses were seen. Another study, 49 cancer patients, 21 with lung cancer, got between 4 and 25 cups worth of green tea compounds a day, and again, no benefits were found. The only benefit green tea may be able to offer lung cancer patients is to help lessen the burns from the radiation treatments when applied on the skin, as green tea compresses may be able to shorten the duration of the burns. The protective effects of green tea applied topically was also seen in precancerous cervical lesions, uh, where the uh, twice-a-day direct application of a green tea ointment showed a beneficial response in nearly three-quarters of the patients, compared to only about a 10% response in the untreated control group, which is consistent with the anti-cancer effects of green tea compounds on cervical cancer cells in a petri dish. But when women just got green tea extract pills to take, the pills didn't seem to help. I've talked about the potential benefit of green tea wraps for skin cancer. Is there any other cancer where green tea actually comes in con direct contact? Yes, colon cancer, which grows from the inner surface of the colon that comes in contact with food and drink. In the colon, tea compounds are fermented by a good gut bacteria into compounds like 3,4-DHPA, which appears to wipe out colon cancer cells, while leaving normal colon cells relatively intact in vitro. So 136 patients with a history of polyps were randomized to get green tea extract pills or not. Now this was a study in Japan, so everyone was already drinking green tea. So effectively this was comparing those who drank three cups a day to four cups a day. Uh, but a year later on colonoscopy, the added green tea group had only half the polyp reoccurrence, and, and the polyps that did grow were 25% smaller. That's pretty exciting. Uh, why hasn't a larger follow-up study been done since? Perhaps due to the difficulty in raising funds for the study, because green tea is a cheap beverage, not a pharmaceutical. But the good news is that thanks to a major cancer charity in Germany, researchers are currently recruiting for the largest green tea cancer trial to date, in which more than 2,000 patients will be randomized. I look forward to presenting the results when they come in. As I've explored before, whether you're young or old, male or female, smoker or non, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, high cholesterol or low, having high levels of a toxic compound called TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, in your bloodstream is associated with a significantly higher risk of having a heart attack, stroke, or dying over a three-year period. Where does TMAO come from? The choline in foods like eggs can be turned by gut bacteria into TMAO, which is then absorbed back into our system. And the more eggs we eat, the higher the levels climb.
Given the similarity in structure between carnitine and choline, the same group of Cleveland Clinic researchers wondered if carnitine, found in red meat, energy drinks, and supplements, might also lead to TMAO production, so they put it to the test. If you feed someone a steak, their TMAO levels shoot up. Now, this was someone who regularly ate meat. Those who eat strictly plant-based may start out with almost no TMAO in their system, uh, presumably because they're not eating any meat, eggs, or dairy. But even if the vegan eats a sirloin, almost no TMAO is made. Why? Uh, presumably they don't have steak-eating bacteria in their guts. Uh, no TMAO is produced if you don't have TMAO-producing bacteria in your gut. If you don't regularly eat meat, then you're not fostering the growth of the meat-eating microbes that produce TMAO. Uh, this suggests that once we develop a plant-based gut ecosystem, our bacteria will not produce TMAO, even if we eat meat every once in a while. However, we still don't know how rapidly gut bacteria shifts after a shift in our diet, but it does not appear to be all or nothing. If you take men eating a standard American diet and have them eat two sausage, egg, and cheese biscuits before and after just five days of eating lots of high-fat meals like that, you can boost TMAO production even higher. Uh, so it's not just do you have the bad bugs or not. You can apparently breed more of them the more you feed them. On the other hand, meat-free diets have been demonstrated to have a profound influence on human metabolism. You can analyze a urine sample, and tell what kind of diet people eat based on measurements like how low their TMAO levels are in the urine of those eating egg-free vegetarian diets. You can even take the same people and rotate them through three different diets, and you can tell who is who who's on a high meat, low meat, or no meat diet, in part based on the different compounds churned out by the different gut flora or different flora activity after just about two weeks on the different diets. It's possible that some of the beneficial effects of whole plant foods may be mediated by the effects they have on our gut bacteria. At the same time, the standard American diet may increase the relative abundance of undesirables that produce toxic compounds, including the cardiotoxicant TMAO. Strictly plant-based diets have gained acceptance as a dietary strategy for preventing and managing disease, perhaps in part because of their rather unique gut flora, less of the disease-causing bacteria and more of the protective species. So all along, we thought the reason those eating plant-based had lower heart disease rates was because they were eating less saturated fat and cholesterol, but maybe their lower TMAO levels may also be contributing to their benefits thanks to their reduction of uh, ingestion of carnitine and choline. I talked about the egg industry response to the choline revelation. How has the carnitine supplement industry reacted? Well, the former VP of AdvoCare, a multi-level marketing company that sells carnitine supplements like SLAM, while getting slammed with lawsuits, finding them, for example, guilty of false misleading or deceptive practices, forced to pay over a million dollars, in response to the research implicating carnitine and TMAO production, he questioned whether there was a secret vegan conspiracy at the Cleveland Clinic, restricting our intake of meat or carnitine supplements to prevent our gut bacteria from making TMAO, he argues, is like trying to prevent car accidents by restricting the sale of fuel. Uh, okay, but there are benefits to transportation. Uh, we're talking about TMAO, which may be fueling our epidemic of heart disease, the number one killer of men and women in this country. As far as I'm concerned, the more we can cut the fuel for that, the better.